one phone call to Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan and tell them to buy US Treasury notes, and they will. The banks will do what they're told. So, but here's here's where the system could collapse. Uh, first of all, Putin would retaliate. Uh, there are well over three hundred billion of dollars of Western assets in Russia. Um, you know, BP, uh, Chevron, Shell, major U.S. oil companies, uh, Starbucks, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, you name it. And they haven't. Uh, a lot of those businesses have kind of pretended to get out of Russia, but the assets are still there. Franchises are still there. Russia has not expropriated them, but they could. They could take all those, uh, and they will. Uh, Putin said, he, he, well, the thing about Putin is he doesn't bluff. He thinks very carefully about what he says. And when he says something, he'll do it, and, and he has. So uh, if the U.S. steals the Russian treasuries, Putin will expropriate Western oil and energy and natural gas assets and just give it to Rosneft or Gazprom, which are the major Russian uh, energy companies. It's estimated that there, it's, it's estimated that there are more Western assets in Russia than there are Russian treasury bonds in the West. So Putin could actually make a profit on this, this whole thing. Jim Rickards, renowned for his astute observations in the financial sphere, delivers a nuanced analysis that unveils the intricate geopolitical maneuvers and economic vulnerabilities reshaping the global financial landscape. Amidst the geopolitical tensions, Rickards sheds light on Russia's strategic leverage, holding sway over Western assets exceeding a staggering $300 billion. Through meticulous examination, he illuminates the potential cascading effects, elucidating the existential threat looming over the US economy. Furthermore, Rickards elucidates the intricate dance banks are forced to perform, compelled to navigate treacherous waters as they repurchase trillions in U.S. treasuries to stave off potential economic calamity. This intricate interplay of geopolitical forces and economic imperatives underscores the critical juncture at which the global financial system finds itself. What happens if investors, savers, uh, markets around the world lose confidence in the U.S. dollar? And by the way, if people lose confidence in the U.S. dollar, don't think for a minute that they're going to run to the euro, the yen, uh, um, pound sterling, Canadian dollars, or whatever. They're not. All those currencies are part of a global euro dollar, U.S. dollar system. Uh, so if you lose confidence in, in U.S. government securities, for example, the U.S. dollar, you're not going to run to uh, you know German bonds or Japanese government bonds. That whole system is going to be uh, severely impaired. In which case, you may have to go back to some kind of gold standard, gold linked, gold backed in some fashion, not because you want to. There's no central bank in the world that wants to go to gold, but they may have to to restore confidence. Now, if you do, if you say, okay, we have to get back to some kind of gold system to restore confidence, what would the price of gold have to be to make that system work? Well, we have a lot of historical precedent. A precedent. There was a, a real gold standard from uh, solid gold standard from 1870 to 1914, modified gold standard from uh, after World War I, say 1919 through uh, World War II, the Bretton Woods standard from 1944 to 1971. So we do have precedent for this. And in every case, you don't have to have enough gold to back 100% of the money supply. Some of the hard shell gold bugs say you do, but that's not true. Historically, you need between 20 and 40%. So let's just take uh, take 40%. Look at the U.S. money supply. And I use M1 uh, because it's um, it's broader than Fed-based money. It includes checking accounts. It's, it's kind of like the, the money from the banks that drives the real economy. So if you take M1 uh, and take 40% of that and say, okay, that's how much gold I need to back it up. And then say, okay, how much gold do I have? The answer is 8,133 tons. That's how much gold the U.S. has. And just do the math. And this is, as I said, this is seventh grade math. Um, is it, what would the price per ounce have to be for 8,000 tons to back up M1? And the answer is $27,000. By the way, I did the same math not that long ago. Well, know, seven, eight years ago. And the answer was closer to $15,000. But the reason it's higher, gold is still gold, but the money supply is a lot bigger. So with the same amount of gold and a larger money supply, you need a higher price per ounce to back up the money supply. And by the way, I spoke to uh, Paul Volcker about this, and he agreed. He said he wasn't advocating for a gold standard, but he said if you had to go back to a gold standard, he just threw his hand in the air and said, oh, the price of gold would be 
unbelievable. And, and of course, he's right. So that number, if, yeah. if, if things kind of remain the way they are and confidence in the dollar remains, we can talk about that, by the way, because there are uh, arrows directed right at the heart of confidence in the dollar having to do with Russian assets and the war in Ukraine. But uh, if confidence is maintained, then it's a, it's a market factor. Maybe you don't get there. But if you have to go back to a gold standard, yeah, $27,000 would have to be the price in order to avoid massive deflation. More likely all the time because of the stupidity or blindness of the Biden administration officials. And here, uh, let's talk about the effort to steal Russian assets. Now, at the outbreak right. of the, the Russian special military operation in Ukraine, at the start of that, the U.S. froze the assets of the Central Bank of Russia. Yes. Almost unprecedented, not completely, but, but almost. Uh, about $300 billion of U.S. Treasury securities owned by Russia. That they had, they had surpluses, they had dollars, they invested the dollars in U.S. Treasuries. They had about three hundred billion. They're all they're all uh, digital uh, book entry. There's no there are no physical treasury securities you can put in a vault. Haven't been since 1979. So this is a digital ledger maintained by the Fed and the and the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury. And Russia had about three hundred billion dollars of treasury securities. So we froze them. Freezing them just means okay, they're still Russia's securities, but they can't use them. They can't collect the interest. They can't pledge them. They can't repo them. They can't sell them. Uh, et cetera. They're just, they're kind of frozen, but they still belong to Russia. Now the U.S. wants to go a step further and seize them, actually convert the title, turn it over to some trust fund for the benefit of Ukraine. Uh, and, and actually they say seize, I say steal. So they want to steal the Russian assets, the $300 billion. Now we have a G7 summit coming up in about two weeks, June 13th to 15th. It's in uh, Apulia in, in Italy. Um, they've been working on this for over six months, but this is uh, two weeks from now. So we're in a countdown mode, uh, Daniela, um, at the G7 meeting. They want to formalize what they're going to do. Now, there's several different proposals. One is just to seize the whole $300 billion. One is uh, to issue a, a $50 billion bond issue backed by the Russian assets. So, you know, uh, of course, Ukraine would default on the bonds and the creditors would seize the assets. It's just a backdoor way of stealing the assets. Some people say, well, we'll just steal the interest. It's about $3 billion a year, so there's about $6 billion of interest piled up. So there are different things in play. We'll see what they actually do at the G7 meeting. But they all, they're all the same in the sense that they involve stealing these Russian assets. Now, it doesn't mean that the next day the U.S. Treasury market collapses. There are you know, forecasts like that. Some people... Get a little hyperbolic. It doesn't mean that. I mean, the the Treasury one phone call to Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan and tell him to buy U.S. Treasury notes, and they will. The banks will do what they're told. So, but here's here's where the system could collapse. Uh, first of all, Putin would retaliate. Uh, there are well over three hundred billion dollars of Western assets in Russia. Um, you know, BP, uh, Chevron, Shell, major U.S. oil companies, uh, Starbucks, Coca Cola, McDonald's, you name it. And they haven't, uh, a lot of those businesses have kind of pretended to get out of Russia, but the assets are still there. Franchises are still there. Russia has not expropriated them, but they could. They could take all those, uh, and they will. Uh, Putin said, he, he well, the thing about Putin is he doesn't bluff. He thinks very carefully about what he says. And when he says something, he'll do it. And, and he has. So uh, if the U.S. steals the Russian treasuries, Putin will expropriate Western oil and energy and natural gas assets and just give it to Rosneft or Gazprom, which are the major Russian uh, energy companies. It's estimated that there it's, it's estimated that there are more Western assets in Russia than there are Russian treasury bonds in the West. So Putin could actually make a profit on this, this whole thing. Uh, but, uh, but here's the, the other play that, uh, you know, it's clear to me because I'm a lawyer, but no one else has even discussed. Where are these assets? There's only about five billion of the 300 in U.S. banks, and those can be t stolen very easily. But over 200 billion are in Euroclear. Euroclear is the largest clearing, settlement, and custody organization in Europe, um, and it has over 40 trillion dollars of total assets—you know, stocks, bonds, other types of securities, etc. 
but it has these uh, 200 billion of the 300 billion of Russian assets, U.S. Treasury securities are in Euroclear. Now, if you seize those, um, Euroclear has offices around the world. They have offices in Bahrain, uh, UAE, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, rep office in Beijing, et cetera. Russia could sue Euroclear in any one of those offices and just take Hong Kong, for example. Hong Kong is an interesting case. It's under the thumb of the communist Chinese, but it kind of walks and talks like a Western legal system. They have lawyers and courts and all that. So Russian lawyers show up in Hong Kong, sue Euroclear for 300 billion or more, you know, with damages, et cetera, uh, and get a judgment in favor of Russia. Russia can now run around the world and seize Euroclear assets that belong to anybody uh, to recover that judgment. You could throw a monkey wrench into the entire global clearance and settlement system by disrupting, wow. by disrupting Euroclear, which is probably second only to DTCC in terms of settlement and clearance. So this is an example of the stupidity of U.S. officials. Johnny Ellen doesn't understand any of this. Her deputy, Wally Adeyamo, doesn't understand it. But the, the real danger is not that the treasury market collapses the next day. That could happen over time. It's that Russia retaliates, right. gets a judgment, and freezes the entire Western clearance and settlement system. I, can't think of, I cannot think of an example, uh, going back years, where the U.S. has been able to think two moves ahead. They're just not that bright. I mean, uh, Blinken, uh, Jake Sullivan, J Janet Yellen's a statistics geek from Berkeley. She doesn't understand this. Her deputy, Wally Adeyamo, he's smarter. He understands sanctions law, but he doesn't know anything about business. He's never spent a day in business. He spent his whole career in the government, and then he was uh, president of the Obama Foundation. That's not exactly uh, you know, what I call market experience for, you know, for a couple of years, then went back into the government. So they, they just don't understand it. I mean, I, maybe I've been in international finance too long, and I do have two law degrees, so I do, th I do think about it, but I would, I would have thought that others would have figured this out, but apparently they have not. As we wrap up today's discussion, let's take a moment to reflect on the profound insights shared by Jim Rickards. We traverse the intricate landscape of geopolitical maneuvering, where Russia holds a strategic advantage, potentially wielding the power to destabilize Western assets valued at over $300 billion. Rickards also illuminated the precarious position of banks, compelled to repurchase trillions in U.S. treasuries to mitigate the looming specter of economic upheaval. These intricate webs of influence underscore the delicate balance of global finance and the interconnectedness of geopolitical forces. Your continued engagement is paramount to our channel's growth and success. We invite you to subscribe to our channel to stay updated on future discussions. Like this video if you found it insightful and share your valuable opinions in the comments section below.